I've been a park ranger at Channel Islands National Park for over 10 years now. The park is located off the coast of Southern California, near Los Angeles. I've amassed a number of strange stories over that time, but this takes the cake. Most of my tales are about strange people, or usual wildlife encounters. All of them have some reasonable explanation in the end, except for this one. I try to watch out for the park and all of its inhabitants, human and animal. This happened during a routine patrol. Things took an unusual turn, to say the least. It was a fine, sunny day to start. That piece of paradise we called the Channel Islands was all shades of greens and blues. And against this backdrop of lush nature, there I was, doing my regular checks. Over the years, I've developed a rhythm for these patrols. I check on the wildlife trails we have tracked and maintain our remote cameras, while soaking in the serenity of the park and its unique landscape. This particular day was no different. The sun was warm, the gulls were loud, and the air was salty. The sea was calm as I patrolled along the remote section of the park. It was peaceful, so damn peaceful, considering what was to come. I remember gazing out at the expanse of the Pacific, watching a container ship in the far distance, and thinking how strange it was that two such worlds existed so close to each other. There was minimal activity in the woods that day, just some deer grazing and squirrels scurrying through the bushes. I was finishing up the day's checks, planning to head back when it happened. I wouldn't say I saw it first, but rather I felt it. A gust of a wind picked up, sending a chill down my spine. It was a cold that didn't belong in the sunny weather. The birds seemed to quieten, and a different form of silence took over. Now you might think I'm exaggerating here, but when you've spent a good portion of your life in the wilderness, you learn to heed these signs from nature. I've always believed that our body speaks a language that's older than words, a primitive form of communication that taps into the instincts we hardly use in the civilized world. And my instincts were blaring sirens. Something was off. I scanned the area for what could have caused the sudden change. That's when I noticed ripples dancing across the otherwise still surface of the water. But they weren't like something caused by wind or a moving boat. It was as if something beneath the water was stirring it. As a seasoned ranger, I'm well versed with the diverse marine life around the islands, but this seemed different. I moved closer to the shoreline, curious and cautious. I saw a shadow in the water, a large one. It wasn't quite identifiable, neither a whale nor a school of seals, the usuals we get around here. There was a strangeness about it, something that unsettled the calm sea. This thing, whatever it was, was huge its shadowy form undulating beneath the clear water. It seemed to glide, smoothly, purposefully. But before I could even make out more, it dived deeper into the sea, away from the coast and my prying eyes. You know the funny thing about such unexpected encounters? One moment, you're the watcher, the observer, the protector, and the next, you're nothing but a confused, curious bystander, trying to make sense of the strange hand you've been dealt. I thought that was the end of the wilderness's odd show, but it felt like the calm before a storm. Out of nowhere, a baffling sound cut through that silence. A bellowing roar, thunder-like and guttural, echoed off the surrounding cliff faces. But it wasn't your typical thunder. The sea and the wind carried an undertone of a growl, originating from the depths of the sea itself. This sound was like no marine or terrestrial creature I've come across in my years at the park. If I had to describe it, I'd say it was like the wrath of the ocean and the eternal wild all woven into one strange sound. I couldn't help but move closer despite the building tension. My curiosity got the best of me. The ocean, which a moment before mirrored a sheet of glass, lashed and thundered, churning with bubbles and waves as if the seafloor was ablaze. It felt like an angry disturbance rippling through the sea's very soul. Suddenly, arcing out of the water, an enormous serpent-like creature rose up from the depths. This was not any known marine animal. It was titanic, easily dwarfing the nearby container ship I mentioned earlier. Outlined against the clear sky, its scale-covered body glistened in the sun. It had broad, fin-like appendages that it used to suspend itself above the waves. Its eyes were eerie, hypnotic even, but not in a gentle way. Rather, 
they carried an unsettling malice. A malevolent intelligence I've never seen in any animal's eyes before. The brine-filled air grew thick with stench. My nostrils were assaulted with a scent as old and distinct as the ocean itself mingled with something foul. The sheer terror of that sudden reveal made my heart race. But before I could react, with a thunderous thrash of its body, it dove back into the now raging waters, creating a whirlpool so fierce the whole shore trembled. Then, as suddenly as the creature had appeared, it was gone. Some might call it a monster, but I'd say it was just another citizen of the wild that we're yet to understand. In the following days, my thoughts kept drifting back to the encounter. It was like watching the park emerge from a shared dream, with the deer grazing, the foxes playing, the birds singing. Everything slipped back into its harmonic routine, as if the chaos was a forgotten echo. You know the best part about being a ranger? It's the privilege of witnessing nature's obscure tales, told by no humans but shared by the trees, the sea, the soil, and the air. This incident is another of these stories. Living at the edge of civilization brings such encounters, reminding us we've only begun to unravel the mysteries tucked away in this vast, beautiful wilderness. I've got a story for you. This one happened a couple of years ago. I'd recently started dating this girl, Lisa, and decided a picnic would be the perfect date. Living in the heart of Colorado, we had no shortage of beautiful nature spots to choose from. We ended up settling on this picturesque meadow surrounded by towering pines, about an hour outside of Denver. I'd spent the previous day stuffing a cooler with sandwiches, cheeses, and fruits. I tried to go all out. After all, Lisa was a city girl. She'd only just moved to Colorado, and I wanted to show her the relaxation of a laid-back, outdoorsy lifestyle. This meadow was perfect. It was like something you'd see on a postcard. We laid out the red blanket, started unpacking the food, and were having a hell of a good day. The sun was beaming and there was just a hint of breeze. Lisa was laughing at my terrible impressions, and for a while everything was going well. Then. Feeling the heat of the day, we both dozed off. I don't know how long we slept, but it was easily close to an hour. I remember being awoken by a sudden coldness, not just the kind of cold from a passing cloud blocking the sun. It felt unnatural, electrical almost. I stirred, sat up and rubbed my eyes, and that's when I first noticed it. A figure lurking at the periphery of the meadow. It was a dark smudge against the vibrant colors. It was hard to make out any specific details from that distance, but something about it put me on edge, and a deep sense of dread clenched around my chest. Was it the way it seemed to hover just at the edge of the forest, the way it seemed somehow both solid and formless at the same time? The thing, whatever it was, stayed in my sight for the better part of an hour. We stayed close to each other on the blanket, whispering about how we were torn between an urge to flee and a weird curiosity that held us rooted to the spot. Admittedly, we were both freaked out but tried passing it off as a bear or some other wildlife. But the sense of unease stayed. It didn't help that the figure was unsettlingly manlike, but hazy, almost blurry. It was like looking through frosted glass. Our little relaxing picnic had been tainted by a sense of dread that was hard to shake off, at least as long as that thing was still there. Then began the sounds. Soft at first, a low hum that could easily be dismissed as the hum of insects or distant river, but it began to increase in volume, becoming a guttural, growl-like echo that seemed to resonate from both everywhere and nowhere. The last thing I remember is grabbing Lisa's hand and scrambling to our feet. Our abandoned picnic left as a sad little island of normality in a rapidly changing landscape of fear. Whatever it was, it stayed in my periphery, never allowing me to look at it directly. It was like a smudge in a pair of glasses that you can't ever clean, or a blind spot in your vision field. I remember Lisa muttering a low, scared, what the hell is that? Her voice barely audible over the unsettling growling. The shadow was growing larger. I don't know how, but it was significantly taller than it was a moment ago and what I'd previously thought to be a trick of perspective 
appeared eerily like horns protruding awkwardly on its head. I didn't know what to say. All I knew was that we had to get out of there. So with Lisa's hand gripped in mine, so hard it hurt, we began running as fast as we could in the opposite direction. Lisa was sobbing now, terrified, but I didn't look back. I didn't want to see it. I don't know how I knew, but I knew if I looked back, that would be it. With a sense of dread, I could smell it now. A strong scent of sulfur and something burning. By the time we reached the safety of our car, the menacing figure had vanished. We jumped in, and I roared the engine to life. Lisa was shaking as she turned around, her eyes wide as saucers. It's gone, she said. Looking back on that event has never been easy. We'd run away from something we didn't truly understand. We knew what we'd seen wasn't human. It wasn't natural. We had no proof, though. I still can't step foot in that meadow. But you want to know the scariest part? When we got back to my home, we found a black feather. The damn thing followed us home. We never saw that figure again. But the smell, that terrible sulfuric smell, I would get whiffs of it in the house for weeks. It finally faded. But the fear, well, the fear never goes away. I can't prove we met a demon that day, but what else could it be? Remember, not everything is as it seems, and sometimes a beautiful day can turn into your worst nightmare. Stay safe out there. My tale isn't your typical campfire ghost story, nor some elaborate urban legend. It's quite personal. Nothing I'd make up for giggles or internet clout. It was a couple of years back around midsummer. I took a vacation and decided to drive up to this secluded lake in Maine. It was a remote place, hardly any tourists and just the perfect place for me to drop a line and catch some peace of mind along with the occasional trout. I've always been one for the serenity of the great outdoors. Fishing is like a form of meditation for me. I went on this adventure solo, which is something I do from time to time. But day felt different. I'm not usual bothered by the feeling of being alone in the vastness of nature, but I felt truly alone that time. Despite my odd feeling, the day began uneventfully. I arrived at the lake just past dawn and set up camp near the shore with all the right gear, my trusty old fishing rod, a six pack of my favorite beer, my lucky fishing hat. As the sun rose higher, I enjoyed a couple of cold ones and cast my line out into the calm waters. The first couple of hours were incredibly peaceful, with nothing but the call of distant loons and a soft breeze to keep me company. Every so often, I'd reel in a decent-sized trout or two. It was shaping up to be an idyllic day. During lulls between catches, I remember losing myself in the soothing rhythm of the lapping waves against the shore and the scent of fresh water. At times, I thought I smelled something briny, almost salty, but I couldn't figure where it was coming from. It was strange, considering we were miles and miles away from the ocean. As the day wore on, I began to notice unusual movements on the water. Around my bobber, the water churned in odd patterns, like there were underwater currents where there shouldn't be. In the stillness of the lake, those ripples seemed out of place. I mean, every fisher knows the typical splash a fish makes. And let me tell you, this wasn't caused by a fish. It was something I've never come across before. Even stranger were the sounds that came with the twilight. The once peaceful symphony of the wilderness was punctuated with an occasional low rumble, like some distant thunder, that seemed to echo from the deepest parts of the lake. And yet, there were no signs of a storm on the horizon. I could have sworn that a gust of an unnaturally cold wind seemed to rise from the surface of the lake. On the first night, I brushed it all off as quirks of the secluded lake, or maybe the beer playing tricks with my senses. But little did I know that these were merely the subtle overtures to an encounter that was nothing short of ominous. The entire experience left me questioning the limits of the natural world. The next morning, a heavy fog blanketed the lake something fairly typical for Maine. But, as the first rays of dawn hinted at another beautiful day, the still water did seem unusually dark. It was as if the lake was reluctant to let go of the night. Regardless, I went about my morning routine, setting up my fishing gear while nursing a hot cup of camp coffee. Going by yesterday's plentiful catches, 
I shrugged off my misgivings and cast my line once more, expecting the gentle tug that indicated a biting trout. But the lake remained oddly still, too still for comfort. Time seemed to slow on that fog-drenched morning. The ever-present breeze was oddly absent, and the surface of the lake lay like a dark, flat mirror. It was then I noticed something stirring beneath the surface. Whatever it was, it was massive. The water rippled in strange patterns. The lake came alive with a low, resonating hum that sent vibrations through the soles of my boots. For a fleeting moment, I saw something, eyes glowing like underwater lanterns, fixing me with their hypnotic gaze. The immense shadow then shifted, causing a sudden swell in the water. With the grace and speed unexpected from a creature of its size, it dove deeper, leaving behind a visible whirlpool. The harsh reality of the situation hit me. I was not alone in this vast, isolated lake. There was a presence, a monstrous creature lurking in its depths, nudging at the edge of my reality. Panic surged through me and froze me in my tracks. Part of me wanted to pack up my gear and flee. The other part, a stupefied witness, was swallowing its fear and staying glued to the very spot. I wanted to see what it was. Eventually, survival instincts won. I grabbed as much of my gear as I could and quickly dismantled my makeshift camp, shoving everything into my car. As I glanced back at the lake, the fog had lifted, but the aura of trepidation hadn't. The lake, once my sanctum of peace, had become a source of nightmares. Driving back home, my mind raced, filled with the image of those glowing eyes and monstrous silhouette. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was in the realm of a large predator. Later, hearing tales from other anglers, my chilling experience found me in company. Other people had seen this creature that inhabits this remote, seemingly serene lake. A charming summer getaway had turned into a visceral reminder of an unknown world, lurking beneath the tranquil facade of nature. Since then, I've kept my distance from the lake. Whenever I muster up the strength to revisit my memory, I'm left with a sense of foreboding. Despite the fear, though, there's a part of me, a stubborn fisherman part, that considers going back. Maybe one day I will. So, this happened about five years ago. The wife and I were out on one of our late night drives. You know those types where you're just cruising along quiet roads where nobody else seems to be around? It was sort of our thing to forget everyday life and just spend some time alone. It was peaceful with the radio humming old tunes. The locations we went to were pretty remote. I can't exactly recall the name of the places we were offhand. We were just driving aimlessly. The road stretched on for ages, surrounded by dense woods on either side. I guess that's why we loved it though, the feeling of being in a world of our own. We loved pointing out random things to each other and wondering what the people were doing inside their houses. By the way, if you've been married as long as I have, you'll understand that these little shared moments are precious. It was an unspoken agreement, a ritual that we always looked forward to. The dusk had already given way to a clear and starry night by the time we started out on our drive. The moon hung high. I would even go as far as to say that it was the perfect night, right up until it wasn't. We were approaching a sharp bend when I first noticed it, an acrid, pungent stench. You expect to smell damp earth, leaves, maybe a skunk if you're unlucky, but this was different. It was putrid. My wife noticed my discomfort and made a face, quickly rolling up her window. Now listen to me. As someone who's practically lived half his life in the woods, I've come across various kinds of smells, but this, this was something else entirely something wrong. And let me tell you, nothing good comes from that kind of smell. Just around the bend, I slowed down, trying to make sense of the rancid odor invading our peaceful night. Then we heard it, a guttural growl that seemed to reverberate in the still of the night. It was loud enough to hear over the sound of the truck's engine. My wife looked at me, her eyes wide, and honestly, I was probably mirroring her expression. The odd part was that whatever this creature was, it wasn't afraid of the truck or the headlights or my honking or even my shouting at it to leave the damn road. I noticed a pair of glowing yellow eyes stare back from within the shadows, 
that the pickup's headlights were reflecting. They were higher than what you'd expect from any four-legged forest animal. Maybe a bear standing on its hind legs, but I knew that couldn't be it. The instinctive chill of fear ran down my spine. God, you won't believe what it was that we saw next. The eyes started to move, sort of bouncing up and down, as if it was attached to something walking. We were transfixed. A silhouette appeared from the shadows, backlit by the glow of our headlights. Right then, the wife let out a terrified gasp beside me. The figure had an enormous width, broader than any man I'd ever seen. That wasn't what made it eerie, though. It was the shape that was downright freakish. The creature, it was like a dog, but it was standing upright. Its muscular arms hung down the sides, ending in what appeared to be elongated feet with noticeable claws that scraped across the black top. Its hunched back and powerful thighs only added to its beastly and grotesque silhouette. And oh God, the face, a long snout or muzzle, like a dog's elongated mouth, with yellow glowing eyes that glinted with a terrifying intelligence. It was watching us as we were watching it. I swear I could see drool dripping from its gnashing jaws. Seeing it walk, it seemed like it was hunched over but stood upright nonetheless. Its legs were oddly similar to that of a canine, if dogs were designed to walk like men. I felt like I was in a nightmare. The creature was covered all over with tufts of thick fur, patches of it sticking out in some places more than others. Its hide was somewhere between black and dark brown, harder to discern with the dim glow from the pickup's headlights. My wife whispered, her words stuck, barely able to pass her trembling lips. Drive drive now. But my hands were glued to the steering wheel. My eyes remained locked on the monstrosity, slowly trudging across the road, indifferent to our car, or even to the high beam pointed directly at it. I'm not sure how long we were sat there. Time seemed to have broken. Finally, the creature disappeared into the dense tree line, leaving behind the acrid stench and a sight that both of us would never be able to forget, or explain for that matter. We drove home that night, but silence swallowed the remaining duration of the journey. We fought to make sense of what we had seen back there, on the lonely country road, but neither of us had answers. In the subsequent weeks, I'd revisited that turn multiple times, but found nothing. We were never the same after that night. Every unseen pair of glowing eyes on the road at night, every unexplained movement in the woods, they all served as dreadful reminders of our encounter with that insane creature. It was also the night that our peaceful drives lost their tranquility forever. A couple of years ago, I was working as a park ranger at Devil's Lake State Park in Wisconsin. I loved everything about that gig, the early sunrises, the cool evening breezes, the quiet serenity of nature, and even the occasional wild animal that took a shine to me. You could say I was living my dream, until this one incident. It was a day like any other at first, but it turned quickly to an experience I still can't wrap my head around. My day always started at the crack of dawn. I'd patrol the well-used trails, check the animal tracks, pick up litter left behind by disrespectful tourists. You know, the usual stuff. Being out there in the wilderness, living off the whims of nature and doing my bit to keep her beauty intact. There was no place I'd rather be. It was a simple life, just me and the great outdoors. One day, my routine sugar maple monitoring took me to the brush line off the quartzite trail. It was a regular gig. Examine the trees for any disease, insects, measure the circumferences and all that. This day, however, the second I stepped off the trail, something seemed off. There was this smell, a stench really. All around me the air was thick with it. It was a pungent, heavy odor that I can only describe as a cross between deep earth and rotting garbage. Might not seem that odd in the wild, but it felt different. I would have dismissed it if not for my gut. I've been out in the wilderness long enough to trust my instincts. When nature talks, we should listen. I learned that the hard way, but that's a story for another time. It wasn't the terrible smell that unsettled me as much as the feeling it brought. There was a sense of wrongness, like something had visited that place that didn't belong. It was then I noticed everything was oddly quiet. Devil's Lake isn't a quiet place in my experience. 
There's always some bird call or rustling leaves, the hum of flowing water or critter scrabbling about. The forest is never really silent, but in that instant, I swear, you could have heard a pin drop. The eerie silence I would have normally welcomed was uncharacteristically chilling. In that tranquility, however, I noticed a faint hum. Now, this is going to sound bizarre, but it was like the low buzz you'd hear around those big old power lines. But this was the wild miles away from civilization, and there were no power lines around. Every instinct I had was screaming at me to turn back, but the forestry service had its procedures, and I had a job to do. Determined, I hauled my equipment further in, shrugging off these feelings, trying to convince myself it was another day in the park. And that's when I saw them, the trees. They were scarred, some kind of burn marks, all blackened and smoky. But it was just those few trees. None of the others were affected. It was as if something had scorched them. It wasn't like a wildfire. The burn marks were made precisely, methodically, even it wasn't natural. That much was clear. After taking down notes and some pictures of those trees, I looked up at the ridge above, and there, there was something. It was some sort of figure. Human, perhaps. Or maybe something else. It took me a moment to process, but by the time I did, they were gone. Now, I have no way to prove this, and you're welcome to be skeptical. But remember, the wilderness doesn't care for our explanations or lack thereof. I'm not sure what happened that day or what I saw, and I sure don't know if others have experienced it too. But one thing's for certain, there's something else out there besides us. So there I was standing among the damaged trees, with that increasingly uncomfortable buzzing in my ears, the kind you'd probably hear if you stood beneath a giant power transformer, which was absurd given that I was way out in the park, miles from any power source. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I started trudging up the forest to the ridge. The stench got worse with each step, not just the rotting garbage smell, but a sulfur-like odor now clung to it. This is where it gets hard to explain. I've always been a creature of instinct, entrusting my life to the silent language of the wilderness many times over. But what happened up at that ridge, I still struggle to comprehend. When I reached the crest, I saw them. They were humanoid shapes of maybe four to six feet tall. They were skinny, with disproportionately large heads and black oval eyes. No noses, no mouths. They were like something straight out of those alien conspiracy theories. There were about a handful of these greys, as people call them, stationed around what looked like some sort of metallic object. They seemed to be examining their surroundings silently, telepathically communicating maybe, I don't know, and that hum, it seemed to be emanating from them. Now, I won't lie, every nerve in my body screamed to bolt, but my feet became rooted to the spot eyes glued to the unsettling spectacle before me. They reeked, the stink mixing with the wood's natural odor, overpowered everything else. I couldn't tell you how long I stood there, staring in abject horror, my heart pounding out a stuttering rhythm against my rib cage. It may have been seconds, or maybe hours, but then one of them turned, its black eyes seeming to look right at me, through me, and the hum intensified. It broke me out of my daze. I bolted. Somehow, don't ask me how, I made it back to my office. I was sweating buckets. My heart was pounding so hard I could feel each beat resonate through me. I locked myself in for the rest of the day, trying to convince myself that what I had seen was a figment of my imagination. But the bizarre condition of the trees and the residual humming in my ears told a different story. Once evening fell and the park grew quiet, I found myself replaying the day's events over and over in my mind, my sleep plagued by the image of those creatures and the haunting hum. Had I crossed paths with extraterrestrial life, or was it some bizarre phenomenon of nature that I had yet to understand? Consequently, I resigned a month later, unable to shake off the lingering fear that came with working in the park. Discussions with other park rangers revealed no similar experiences and I learned that the trees eventually recuperated from what looked like burn damage. Despite several sleepless nights and an enduring unrest, I consider myself lucky for having escaped unharmed. I'm still uncertain of what happened that day, 
All I can do is carry the haunting memories of those black, soulless eyes and the unceasing hum, always reminding me that something out there didn't belong to this world. I was a botanist. Now, of course, I think it's a rather fascinating subject, but I won't kid myself. Studying plants puts most people to sleep. There's still a lot to learn out there. There are new species of plants and fungi being discovered every year. However, I never imagined I'd ever run into anything quite like this. I had just relocated back to Canada after doing a two-year field study in the Yudicon. I took a position at a lab in Alberta. I was there maybe six weeks at the time that this happened. A scientist I had not yet met pulled me off my project to examine some of their latest field samples. I took a look at the samples. Most of them were specimens from tropical and subtropical plants. Nothing too out of the ordinary. I took a quick look at the soil they had brought back and it was extremely acidic. My best guess was that it was taken from a location high in geothermal activity. But like I said, the plants they had me look at were ordinary tropical plants. No new species, no oddities. That is, until I learned the location that they were sourced. I should make note that the original information was hidden from me. I'm certain I wasn't meant to see it. I wanted to talk to the scientist who had me looking at these plants. He had a private lab on the premises. I went looking for him, assuming that he was in his lab. The lab was dark, but the door wasn't locked. So I went in. I really wasn't intending to snoop through his things. The file was lying right on top of his desk. I found the field notes and the locations of the samples. It didn't make any sense. They were from the Northwest Territories, specifically Nahani National Park Reserve. That means there is an Arctic rainforest somewhere up near the Yukon. And judging from the soil samples, it is being warmed by geothermal activity. If the GPS coordinates on the notes are correct, this is a huge find. I read the rest of the notes as quickly as I could. I was certain that this file was not for my eyes to see, and I didn't want to linger in this guy's private lab any longer than I needed to. The Arctic rainforest was plausible to me after seeing the samples myself, but some of the other things in the file were things I had a hard time believing. After escaping the lab seemingly without incident, I took to researching the Hani Valley. It's nearly impossible to get to without a float plane and is arguably one of the most remote wilderness areas of the world. But there's more. There's a trove of myth and legends coming out of that place. I'm not one to put much stocks into stories like that. It seems like there's always this logical explanation at the bottom of it, but there might be something to it, at least some of the stories. The rest of what I read in the scientist's field notes were nothing short of bizarre. Like I said, I could get on board with the rainforest. If there was enough geothermal activity to warm the valley year round, it is plausible that the tropical flora could survive, even thrive in such an environment, provided it was protected somehow from the harsh tundra biome around it. I really don't know how to say this next part without sounding insane but I'll give it my best shot. The field notes in the file claimed to have observed megafauna in the valley, and from their descriptions, I'd say ancient megafauna. Think of creatures like mammoths, short-faced bears, dire wolves, but it gets even stranger. I noticed a drawing that one of the scientists made. It appeared to be a large winged reptile. The notes with it gave three different GPS coordinates, all in the northern section of the Nahani Valley. The notes also stated that it had colorful feathers, a lizard-like head, and a creature that appeared aggressive towards humans. I was dumbfounded. This was a dinosaur. A living dinosaur. Imagine a tropical oasis in the middle of a tundra where actual dinosaurs still exist. Imagine what other species could be living there? 
I had to know more. I ran into the scientists later that day and tried to press him for more information without letting on that I knew what was in that file of his. I asked where the samples were taken from, but he ignored the question. I then asked if there would be any options for field studies in the near future because I would like to be involved in the next one. I was new at the lab, so it wasn't an odd question, but he just said he didn't know. I think he knew that I found his file. He took me out to lunch a few days later, and I noticed the information I had recorded about the plants from the Nahani was scrubbed from my computer when I returned. I couldn't exactly ask him about it either, because then I would have to admit to snooping through his files. And to be honest, I was afraid of what might happen to me if anyone found out for sure that I knew. It's been quite a few years since that incident. I'm retired now, and that other scientist was quite a number of years older than me, so I feel like it's a good time to tell this story. I've been contemplating visiting the Nahani Valley for years now, but the Parks Canada has limited the amount of parks open to the public, and not surprisingly, the area I'd like to go to has been closed off. Maybe it's for the best, but God, do I wonder what's out there. I was born and raised in Lake Champagne, and I had always heard stories about mysterious creatures lurking in the lake's depths. However, being a rational and skeptical person, I had never given much thought to these legends. In fact, I had often found the locals' obsession with Champy to be a hilarious gimmick to attract tourists to the area. Vermont's baseball team is even called the Vermont Lake Monsters. I always found it ridiculous, but now I'm a strong believer and advocate for Champy. I had recently returned to Lake Champlain for a family reunion and had decided to spend some time on the lake as I used to as a child. I brought my kayak and set out to explore the quiet and serene waters of the lake. Little did I know that my routine kayaking trip would soon turn into a terrifying encounter. As I paddled my kayak through the calm waters, I suddenly heard a loud splashing noise coming from the water nearby. At first, I thought it was just a school of fish or a group of ducks, but then I saw something that made my heart skip a beat. Standing just a few feet away from my kayak was a large, serpentine creature that resembled the classic image of a sea serpent. It was at least 30 feet long and had a smooth, dark greenish black body that glistened in the sunlight. It had a large, snake-like head that bobbed in and out of the water, and its eyes were a bright and pierced yellow color. I was terrified as I was watching the creature glide past me, leaving a large wake behind it. As it swam away, I could see its powerful tail propelling it through the water. I couldn't believe my eyes, but I knew that what I had just seen was real. I returned to the shore and immediately shared my experience with my family, who were all shocked and fascinated by my story. They told me they had always heard similar stories about Champy from the locals in the area, but had always dismissed them as a mere legend, as I had. As the days passed, I became more and more obsessed with the creature I had seen. I spent hours researching similar sightings and stories online, trying to make sense of what I had witnessed. The more I delved into the subject, the more unsettled and frightened I became. I knew I had to find answers and seek help, so I contacted local marine biologists and researchers. Apparently, I was far from the first person to contact them about an encounter with Champy. They were skeptical of my story at first, but eventually agreed to meet me and hear my story. During the meeting, I explained to them that I had seen and how it was similar to several accounts of the lake monster I had came in contact with. 
They also shared their own research on the lake's ecosystem and the possibility of undiscovered creatures in the area. They eventually concluded that the creature I had seen was either a log or a new and previously unknown species of water serpent. They said it was probably not Champy, but admitted that Lake Champagne was large enough to host a variety of different creatures, including undiscovered ones. The possibility of the creature I had seen was real and not just a legend, was both exhilarating and terrifying. It was a reminder that there was still so much that we didn't know about the planet we live on, and the possibility of encountering the unknown was always present. As the days passed, I slowly began to come to terms with my encounter and the realization that the creature I had seen was real. I also learned to accept that the lake held many mysteries that were waiting to be discovered. Seeing Champy with my own eyes left a lasting impression on me, and I found myself more open to the idea of the unexplained and the possibility of encountering the unknown. I left Lake Champagne with a newfound appreciation for the mysteries of the world and a sense of wonder about what other secrets the lake held. In the weeks and months that followed, I continued researching the creature I had seen and shared my story with others interested in the unexplained. I also began advocating for protecting Lake Champagne's unique ecosystem and the creatures that called it home. I wasn't the only one to do this. There are several towns and states that have passed resolutions to protect Champy. Back in 1981, the town of Port Henry in New York made a bold move by declaring its waters a safe haven for Champ. They recognized the importance of preserving the creature's habitat and ensuring that it was free from harm. The following year, in 1982, the state of Vermont passed the House resolution to protect Champ as well. This was a huge win for people who believed in the existence of the creature and wanted to see it safeguarded. In 1983, both the State Assembly and the State Senate in New York also passed resolutions to protect Champ. This was a major step forward in the fight to preserve the creature's habitat and ensure that it was able to thrive in the lake. These resolutions not only helped to protect Champ, but also raised awareness about the importance of preserving the natural world around us. It's a reminder that we still have much to learn about the mysteries of the world and that it's up to us to protect and preserve the creatures that call it home. I could nerd out about the specifics all day, but I'll stop there. Looking back on my encounter with the creature, I realized that it had opened my eyes to a whole new world of possibilities. There were still so many mysteries waiting to be uncovered and I was excited to be a part of that journey. My encounter with the creature debunked my skepticism and reminded me that the world was full of surprises. I also realized that local legends and myths often hold a kernel of truth and are worth investigating, rather than simply dismissing them as superstition. Growing up in Alabama, I had heard many tales of strange creatures lurking in the woods, but I had always dismissed them as myths. My spouse and I were both excited to explore the wilderness and spend some time away from the stresses of our daily lives, and of course, celebrate our new life together as husband and spouse. I work as a software engineer, and my spouse is a nurse. We were both in need of a break and we couldn't think of a better way to relax than spending our honeymoon in nature. One night, as we were sitting outside the cabin, we heard a strange noise in the woods. It was a low, guttural growl that we had never heard before. We both stood up and tried to see what was making the noise, but it was too dark to see anything. We both decided to head inside after a little while, we didn't give it another thought that night. The next day, 
during breakfast, we were discussing what kind of animal it could have been, and a curiosity got the best of us. We decided to explore the woods to see if we could find any clues about what had made the noise. We walked for several hours, enjoying the peaceful surroundings, but we found nothing unusual. On the second night of our honeymoon, we were sitting outside the cabin again when we heard the growling noise once more. This time, it was louder and more sustained. We decided to investigate and walked out into the woods with flashlights. In hindsight, this was probably foolish, but we are both adventurous by nature. As we walked deeper into the woods, we heard rustling in the bushes. We couldn't see anything, but I got the feeling something was watching us. That's when we saw it. A huge, tall, beastly creature stood about 50 feet away from us. It had long arms and legs covered in white fur and glowing red eyes. We were both terrified. Neither of us had ever seen red eyes like that on anything before. It really freaked us out. We slowly backed away from the creature, but it followed us. It seemed curious, but not dangerous. We didn't know what to do and felt trapped. The thing could have easily killed us in one swipe if it wanted to. We were both scared and our hearts were racing. We didn't know what the creature wanted and we were afraid that it would attack us. As we continued to back away, the creature started to approach us. It was getting too close for comfort and we were afraid that it would attack. But just as we thought it was going to pounce, it stopped and looked at us with its glowing red eyes. I grabbed my spouse's hand and sprinted towards the cabin. When we got back to the cabin, I looked back, assuming the creature was right on our tail, but it was nowhere to be found. My spouse wanted to go back out and try to make contact, but there was no way. I was going to let either of us get near that thing. We were both confused and didn't know what to make of the creature. We decided to do some research and found out that it was a rare and elusive creature known as the White Thing or Albino Bigfoot. We reached out to a highly reviewed wildlife expert we found on the web who confirmed that the creature we saw was indeed a White Thing. He explained that the creature was not known to be dangerous and that it was probably just curious about us. He explained that the creature was a solitary animal that lived in the woods and was rarely seen by humans. He also told us that there were few documented sightings of the white thing, but that it was known to be non-aggressive and typically avoided human contact. After our encounter, my spouse and I had a newfound respect for creatures that live in the wilderness. We realized that there was so much about the natural world that we didn't know, and we felt lucky to have witnessed something so rare and unique. We never saw the white thing again after that. We spent the rest of our honeymoon exploring the woods, enjoying each other's company, relaxing, and the peaceful surroundings. As we left Alabama and returned to our daily lives, my spouse and I couldn't stop thinking about the white thing. We felt grateful to have had the opportunity to see such a rare creature and were left with a sense of wonder and awe. We continued to research the white thing and other elusive creatures that lived in the woods. We shared our story with family and friends and it became a topic of fascination and intrigue. Looking back on our encounter with the white thing, my spouse and I both agreed that it was a once in a lifetime experience. We felt lucky to have witnessed something so rare and unique, and we knew that it would stay with us for the rest of our lives. Our encounter with the white thing opened up our eyes to the mysteries of the natural world. We realized that there is so much that we don't know and there are still many secrets waiting to be uncovered. 
We felt lucky to have been a part of that journey, and we look forward to exploring more of the world's wonders in the future. I live in a small town in Tennessee where everyone knows everyone. I've been making moonshine for over 20 years, and I'm known for having the best recipe in the county. But I'm sure as you know, making moonshine is illegal. So I must be careful and keep my operation hidden. I was checking on my still one afternoon when I noticed something hovering in the sky above my property. It was a strange looking balloon shaped aircraft that I had never seen before. I immediately became suspicious and started to think that it might be spying on me. The aircraft was hovering silently in the sky and I couldn't see anyone inside. I was spooked to say the least. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. I walked around my property to get a closer look at the aircraft. It was a strange shape, almost like a giant balloon with a gondola attached to the bottom. The aircraft continued to hover above my property for several hours, and I couldn't shake the feeling that it was watching me. I tried to ignore it, but I couldn't stop looking up at it. I didn't know whom to turn to for help or what to do. I decided to call a friend who worked for the local police department and he came over to check it out. You know what they say. It pays to have friends in high places. When he saw the aircraft, he was just as puzzled as I was. As the day wore on, the aircraft started to get closer and closer to my property. It was obvious that it was deliberately trying to spy on me, and I was starting to get nervous. I started to worry that the aircraft might be some sort of government spy device and that they might be coming after me for making moonshine. As the aircraft got closer, I could see that it had some sort of camera attached to it. I knew that if it got too close, it could be dangerous. I decided to call the FAA to report the strange aircraft. They were just as puzzled as I was and said they would investigate. A few days later, two men from the FAA showed up at my property to ask me some questions. They took some photos of the aircraft and asked me if I had seen it before. I told them everything I knew, and they thanked me for my cooperation. They told me that the aircraft was a type of drone used for research, and that it had been flying in the area for several weeks. They said that it was not spying on me, but rather studying the environment. Although I was relieved to hear that the aircraft was not spying on me, I was still suspicious of the government's intentions. I wondered what else they were studying and what else they were keeping hidden from the public. After the FAA investigation, the aircraft never returned to my property. I went back to making my moonshine and tried to forget all about the whole incident. But the experience had me left with a sense of unease and distrust for the government. I couldn't help but wonder what else the government was keeping from the public. It made me feel like they were always watching and monitoring us. Even in the privacy of our own homes, it was a chilling thought. I started to do more research about government surveillance and the use of drones for spying. It opened my eyes to a whole new world of secrecy and surveillance, and it made me question everything I thought I knew. Looking back on the encounter, I realized how easy it was for the government to keep things hidden from the public. The incident taught me to be more vigilant and aware of my surroundings. As a moonshiner, I'm used to operating in the shadows and keeping things hidden. But the encounter with the strange aircraft had made me realize that there were even darker forces at work, ones that I couldn't even imagine. It was a sobering thought, and it made me question everything I thought I knew about the world.
I've heard these types of stories before. They always come from the same sorts of people, don't they? Skeptics. It could be because the people who believe don't feel the need to share their stories with just anyone. They are not as desperate for that validation. I wasn't a skeptic, though, and I want to talk. I thought avoiding a career in wildlife and forest protection was going to save me from having an encounter with anything weird. My grandmother used to warn me about the spirits in the forest. I never had a reason to tangle with them, so I kept out. I guess eventually we were bound to spread ourselves a little too thin. We pushed into too many of those once wooded areas. Maybe we invited the spirits out of their homes and into ours. That's where I saw it, after all, in my home. And what other reason would there be for a monster to walk through my back door? I work from home. Does that discredit me somehow? Maybe that's the reason you only hear these stories from people who have credentials. It does feel a little sketchy when I admit that I was sitting in front of my computer, staring at a blank text document, when the beast came knocking. I often lose track of time when I'm working. I do my errands during the day so I can afford to zone out and ride into the small hours of the evening. I don't know what time it was when I first heard the sound. It was a scratching at first, somewhat faint. It sounded similar to the squirrels I'd sometimes hear crossing the roof of my patio. It was a little longer, a little sharper, but it wasn't far enough out of the ordinary for me to take notice. The second sound was, that one I know, I heard at 11.34 p.m. There was a single loud knock against the back of my house. My eyes immediately jumped to the clock. I was never the type to give visitors that late. And my friends weren't the type to bang on the siding of my home instead of on the front door. I talked myself out of investigating. It was easier for me to ignore it and to deal with the problem in the morning. Then. It knocked again, one, two, three times in rapid succession. It sounded like a heavyweight boxer was trying to punch its way through my wall. I reached for my phone in case I needed to call someone. I made my way to the back door, unlocked it, and stepped outside. My neighborhood had problems with raccoons and other small pests. I didn't know why, but I had quickly convinced myself that they were the culprits. They must have knocked a garbage can over or something, rolled it into the wall. I was right about one thing, at least. My garbage was toppled over. That was the only excuse I needed to believe my own lie. I focused on cleaning what I could, scraping the debris into the can, then grunting as I lifted it upright. I didn't hear the animal walk into my home. I didn't think twice about leaving that back door open. I always lock my doors now. When I returned to the doorway, looking in, it was right there, waiting for me. The monster looked back as if I was the one intruding on its home. It stood at least a foot taller than me. Its shoulders were wide and covered in mangy fur. A dog's head sat on its shoulders. My heart was hammering. The thing I was looking at, animal or spirit or whatever, wasn't supposed to exist. It certainly wasn't supposed to exist here. I froze. I couldn't pass through the doorway and I couldn't turn to run. As its eyes shimmered in the dim light, I realized how doomed I really was. I realized how small I was. The security of my home wasn't going to protect me any more than a blanket over my eyes. I avoided the forest, sure, but the forest had come for me, or so I thought. When the beast sprinted at me, I blacked out. I remember hearing sharp toenails scraping the tile floor. I remember it closing in, then nothing. I woke up the next morning with the worst headache I had ever felt. I was still sprawled in the threshold of my back door. It must have slammed into me. My head must have hit the doorframe. 
I wasn't harmed otherwise. I tried calling the police. When they learned that nothing was stolen, they seemed to lose interest. They suggested I call animal control. I did that too, you know. I wanted whatever help I could get. I described what I saw and the personnel either broke out into laughter or nudged me out of the room. The more I talked, the more crazy I was made to seem. Then I started to think about the stories, the ones that go like this, that come from the people whose jobs put them directly in the paths of these creatures. I got in contact with a few local park rangers. None of them wanted to speak to me. Strangely, one of them said that even if I'd seen something, then I knew as much as they did. Was that supposed to be reassuring? What was it supposed to mean? I felt like they were acknowledging something, at least. It felt like maybe I wasn't the first one to bring this to their doorstep, but it quickly became clear that they wanted their doorstep clear of any stories like mine. They acted like I was bringing the monster into their homes just by speaking the words in front of them. My grandmother is no longer with us. I can't ask her for the answers that I know she'd have. So, I've resorted to this. I told you what I've seen. Please, tell me what it means. I was called out to do a wellness check on an older woman staying in a cabin in northern Idaho. The call was made by her family. They said she went to the cabin to do some sort of research, but that she would check in with them daily, and she hadn't checked in. Her family didn't say what kind of research she was doing. They did tell me she was a bit eccentric. She had driven to Idaho all the way from Nebraska and had plans to stay out there for at least a month. She was traveling alone, but always checked in with one of her daughters every day. I reached the cabin, and her car was parked out front. I could see the lights on the cabin, and the silhouette of someone sitting at a desk in what looked like the living room. I knocked on the door, and no response. I knocked again, and still nothing. She must have been able to hear me, but then again, she was old and could have had some hearing difficulties. I knocked on the door a third time, and again, no response. I turned the handle, and the door was open, so I announced myself and walked in. I was relieved to find the woman at the desk alive, but she was unwell. Physically, she looked fine, but I thought she was suffering from some psychotic episode. By the way she was muttering, and repeating herself. I tried as best as I could to get her to talk to me, but she kept saying the same things over and over and over again. They're still alive. After all these years, they're still alive. I had no idea on earth what she was talking about, so I made the mistake of asking her. She pulled me over to her desk, where she had a bunch of maps of Canada in the western United States. There were these notes scribbled all over the maps and markers all across the west. She had an overlay of known cave systems and tried to explain to me that they live in the caves. I have no idea who they were, but I didn't think I would be able to make much sense of her ramblings. She sounded like she had gone completely bonkers. I tried explaining the reason for my visit, but she didn't seem to care. Now, I'm not one to get involved in people's personal drama, but she really seemed unwell. So, I called an ambulance. The EMTs practically had to drag her away from her work, but there wasn't much else we could do. I took a closer look at her workspace to try to get a clearer picture of what was going on. From the looks of it, she believed that there were cavemen or Neanderthal-type people living in remote mountain locations in both the U.S. and Canada. It was totally insane. I called her daughter and let her know that her mom was okay, but seems to have suffered some type of mental break. I also told her about the cavemen 
That didn't surprise her. In fact, she told me that was the whole reason her mother was out there. She was a retired archaeologist and was searching for a race of mountain-dwelling cave people. Now I've heard a lot of strange things over the course of my career, but this one takes the cake. There wasn't an investigation to do here. The woman was receiving medical care. I had no reason to go through her things, other than to find out if she was well or not, but curiosity got the best of me. I took a few photos of her maps. One of the locations she had circled multiple times wasn't too far from here, so I decided to go take a look for myself. In hindsight, I should have brought someone with me, but how would I explain I was going off into the wilderness to look for a long lost species of ancient human? I must have hiked 25 miles that day and I didn't find a thing. I don't know what I expected. This woman was obviously crazy, but just as I was about to throw in the towel, I saw something in the dirt beneath my feet. It looked like a spear point. I don't think these are uncommon finds out here, and who knows what time period it could be from, or who made it. But it gave me a little encouragement to keep looking. The woman's map said there was a cave system nearby, but I couldn't see any signs of it. And then, just like I did with the spear point, I stepped right into it. Someone had gone to great lengths to hide the entrance to the cave. It went straight into a rock face, but there were trees directly in front of it, almost like they had been planted there. Hanging from the trees were vines and slabs of moss to disguise the opening. I moved the moss to the side. The smell permeating from the cave was foul. I used to work cleaning zoo enclosures when I was in high school and it rivaled even that. I could barely breathe without gagging. I peered inside and saw a faint glow from somewhere deeper within the cave. There were definitely people in here and I wasn't about to go in and disturb them. I slowly backed away and made a blind for myself on the opposite side of the valley. I was going to wait there until they came out. It wasn't until almost dark when one of them emerged from the cave and even in the dim light, I was quite certain it wasn't a Neanderthal. It was some sort of humanoid ape, maybe Bigfoot. I wasn't sure. It had hair all over its body, and it was hair. It wasn't a caveman wearing animal skins as clothes. It was difficult to see, but its face was more ape-like than human. It didn't have hair covering its face or its hands. I didn't get a good look at its feet. If I had to guess, I would say it stood about five and a half to six feet tall. It went on both two legs and four. I didn't get to watch it very long. I think it spotted me in the blind and went back inside the cave. I was afraid it was going to come back out with others. So I quickly got myself out of there. There was no way I could fight off a group of these things if they attacked me. They clearly had spears and it looked like they had mastered fire as well. I didn't want to take any chances with something that intelligent. I never went looking for them again. I figured if they wanted contact with humans, they can come down from their mountains. But until then, I'm not going to look for them. The National Guard doesn't often get called upon to aid firefighters when things get particularly dangerous. However, we always answer the call. We might not be able to help beyond staffing road closure locations, but we do what we can. I reminded myself of that as we joined a team working to repress the megafire in Oregon last year. I could help, so I would. I couldn't have imagined the trouble that I was getting into. I was stationed along the perimeter of the fire's projected burn radius. I had a vehicle to block the road, the necessary signage to notify drivers, and another member of the National Guard 
to ensure that we looked like we meant business. Unfortunately, that meant only one other human being would witness the same thing that I did that day, and no one would believe the two of us. When we first set up position on the road, the fire was still a while away. The plumes of smoke were visible overhead, but the heat and the glow wouldn't be upon us for a while. We tried to remain grateful. There were already men out there in the throes of the fire, risking their lives. We could handle a little traffic. Word got out quick that the road was closed. Civilians stopped coming our way well before the flames encroached on our location. We had time to kill. I don't remember seeing a single animal in all that time. I didn't hear a bird call or a squirrel hurrying by. We didn't think much of it then. Why would we? It seemed like the animals knew to clear out before we did, that's all. We were more worried about the people living near the area. If the fire continued to spread unchecked, there would be homes in danger. More homes, I guess. The heat and the smoke were already affecting some beyond our little road. Just when we started to feel the heat, we heard the roar. There was a long, pained bellow from somewhere deep inside the forest. In the direction of the fire, it sounded like something big was wounded. Both of us, I think, assumed it was a black bear. I'd never heard a bear sustain a cry quite that long, but these weren't exactly normal circumstances. If I was being chased out of my home by a giant cloud of smoke, I'd be screaming too. We kept listening. When the cry came again, and this time sounded a little more human, we took notice. It wasn't covered by our training, but we knew better than to ignore the hair standing up on our necks. We approached the side of the road and tried to look deeper into the woods. We didn't have much luck. We couldn't leave our post to look for the monster or the man that was making these sounds. So we just stood and stared. The cries were almost continuous and they were coming closer. Soon, they blended in with the whistling cries of the burning trees and the loud popping of the wood. The forest fire was playing a haunting song for the two of us. Then the man beside me pointed it out, the shape in the woods. It appeared from behind a gust of smoke. I could barely make it out at first. When the gray cloud cleared though, there was no mistaking it. It was the size of a man, a very large man I mean, and it was standing upright its fur was obviously thick, but I couldn't tell the color. It was packed with soot. A large patch on its side had been burned. I could see its blistered skin. The animal, whatever it was, looked like it was in pain. Its face, vaguely ape-like, was contorted into an expression of absolute fear. It didn't understand what was happening. It didn't know where to go. It was looking at us like we were the enemy, and maybe we were. I don't know the name for the creature I saw, but I doubted immediately that it ever had a friendly run-in with a human being. It was too intimidating. It was too strange, just slightly beyond the realm of normal things that you see in the woods. I wished it wasn't hurting, but I wasn't taking another step towards it. Neither of us did. I think that might have been the wrong call. The beast ran away, and not in the right direction. It ran back toward the fire. We remained at our post. We didn't speak of the creature we saw that night. The next day, we gathered our wits and tried to report it, but no one wanted to hear about a monster in the woods. They let us write a report. They filed it away somewhere. The whole process was very rehearsed, very condescending. I don't know what they wanted me to think. I don't know if they wanted me to think I was crazy, or they didn't want to deal with the ramifications of whatever we encountered. I got the feeling that this wasn't the first member of the National Guard 
who was told to keep something like this quiet. So I did. I tried to. My buddy didn't. And he couldn't stop talking. I haven't heard from him in a while. Haven't seen him. He stopped updating his social media. That got me thinking. There's going to be a day when I go quiet too. Isn't there? One way or another, we all get quiet eventually. This story I've got, I know it's weird. I know it's hard to believe. But maybe it's worth telling. Maybe someone else has seen the same creature that I did. Maybe it didn't perish in the fire. What do you think? Have you seen it? Have you heard of anyone else who did? Tell me, should I go back and look for the beast that we saw that day? Should I brave the woods, search the ashes, and get a real answer for once? I'm a 28-year-old man living in New York City, working as a graphic designer. I come from a small town in Arkansas, where my parents still live. I decided to take a break from the hustle and bustle of city life and visit my parents for a few weeks. Little did I know that my trip would turn into an unforgettable experience and frankly, a freaking nightmare. I had been staying with my parents for a few days and things were starting to get a little tense. My dad kept telling me to get a real job and my mom wouldn't stop talking about her church group and the dangers of marijuana on today's youth. As a somewhat sane, rational human being, I needed to get out of there before I said something to my parents that I would later regret. I loved my parents deeply, but after that trip, my visits with them lasted no more than a week. I find they're much easier to love in the small doses. Anyway, I needed to get out of there to maintain my sanity, so I decided to go for a hike in the nearby mountains. Growing up in Arkansas, I was constantly playing around in the woods, hiking and camping. But admittedly, having lived in New York for a while, my outdoorsy side had dwindled significantly since my childhood. I was totally unprepared, brought nothing but a water bottle, and should have taken a deep breath before rushing out of the house. A couple of minutes of preparation goes a long way when you're venturing into the unknown. Anyway, I had been hiking for a while, enjoying the fresh air and the beauty of the wilderness, but then I saw something that seriously freaked me out. There was this insane, humongous creature in the woods, sleeping peacefully and snoring loudly. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The creature was bigger than a bear, with a huge body, fat legs, thick black shaggy hair and giant horns. I had never seen anything like it before. The sound of its snore was quite bizarre. For its size, it didn't make a very deep sound. It was more of a strange rattling sound. It was as if I was hearing multiple creatures snoring at once. It sounded almost demonic and I will never forget the sound that thing made. In hindsight, I should have just gotten out of there then. That thing could have easily mauled me if it really wanted to. But I was mesmerized by the creature, and I couldn't help but get closer to get a better look at it. The closer I got to the creature, the more I could hear its crazy sounding snore at though through the forest. It was fascinating, but also terrifying at the same time. As I mentioned, I was completely unprepared to be that deep in the woods, especially around a creature like this. I didn't have my cell phone on me, and as a New Yorker, I didn't own any guns. I will admit, being this close to the creature has made me rethink this, and I've been seriously considering getting a shotgun or the next time I go wandering through the woods. I had to tell someone about what I had seen. So I rushed back to my car to head back to my parents' house. My mind was racing on the way there, going through all the possibilities of what I could have seen. It wasn't a bear because it had giant horns. It wasn't a deer or moose or anything like that. 
It was far too large and could probably devour a deer in one sitting. I knew that what I had seen was something out of the ordinary and I was grateful I didn't wake it up. If I had, who knows what could have happened. I got back to the house, ran inside, and told my parents about the creature I had seen. I should have known the reaction wasn't going to be particularly supportive, but they both really made me angry. My dad just laughed at me and made several comments about my intellect. My mom accused me of smoking the devil's lettuce and pleaded with me to cleanse my sins and confess at her church. No matter how much I insisted that I was telling the truth, it just made things worse. That night, I couldn't stop thinking about the creature I had seen. I knew I had to go back and get a better look, even though it was risky. The next morning, I packed my cell phone, some gear, a camera, and my dad's gun, just in case I would need it. I was much more prepared this time, and I headed back to the mountains. As I got closer to the spot where I'd seen the creature, I started freaking out. What if it was awake this time? What if it was aggressive? What if there was more than one? Was this a suicide mission? I tried to calm myself down, but my imagination was running wild. I finally made it back to the spot, and the creature was no longer there. I was relieved from my safety, but my curious side was disappointed. At the very least, I wanted to snap a picture of the thing so I could show people. Can you imagine how awesome it would be to take a selfie with an unknown beast in the background? Talk about going viral. I eventually left my parents' house and made the long trek back home. As soon as I got there, I started searching online for anything I could find that was like the experience I had. I just knew I couldn't have been the only person in the world to see a creature that big and impressive. After reading for an extensive period of time, I discovered that what I saw could be what they call the Ozark Howler. There were sightings of this beast in Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Texas. The description definitely matched what I saw. It felt good to know that I wasn't crazy. And I wasn't alone. I'm an expert with an animal science background. I had been studying several years in the field of zoology. Mostly, I was interested in studies about reptiles. I had several types of lizards and snakes, so my interest in these types of creatures was quite overwhelming to some. It was hard to keep friends and romantic partners because they seemed very disturbed by it all. Of course, this was decades ago, so I'm sure it's a bit different these days. Anyway, I had several colleagues that wanted to do a research paper on reptiles native to the Everglades. More specifically, we were really wanting to understand the decreasing population of the Florida soft-shelled turtle and if it was an issue involving urbanization. So we all had flew off to Florida. I had never been to the Everglades before, but I've always wanted to go because of the vast wildlife. It was more humid there than I had anticipated, but I was also from a very dry climate, and reptiles absolutely love the humidity. I don't know why I was so shocked. I suppose... It was because I was used to the humidity being enclosed in a terrarium as opposed to it around me. It was refreshing though. Being near an ocean and being able to smell the organic scent of animals, it was like heaven. I know plenty of people would be grossed out by this, but not me. I loved it. In fact, I really considered moving there prior to the frightful events I'm about to describe to you. We had spent one night already. We had just landed in Florida, so we went straight to the hotel and slept. That morning, we got up, packed our equipment, and headed towards the Everglades. I was told very often, 
by hotel workers, our driver, etc., that we might see an alligator in the road. I was terribly disappointed when we didn't see any. There was a vast amount of wooded area just heading toward the Everglades. My mind really considered how many species of reptiles could be in those woods that hadn't been discovered yet. I couldn't help but feel excited. Finding a new species of turtle would be very beneficial for me and my team, but I knew we had other work to do. We really needed to put our focus on the soft-shelled turtles. Once we got to the outskirts, it was pretty much a quick transition onto fan boat, something I had never seen or heard before in my life. It was a little scary because it was literally a flat piece of material attached to a fan. There were no sides whatsoever, and though I loved reptiles, I really didn't want to be gator bait. People think that because I love these creatures, it makes me immune to fear. Really, I know so much about them that it frightens me to think of what would happen if I ever got into a tangle with them. Anyway, the captain of the boat assured us that we'd be fine, that the boat was more safe than it looked. They asked us if we'd ever been in the area before. None of us had but they said that it was amazing, the environment and the things you'd see. I wasn't crazy about our mode of transportation, but they were right. It was beautiful. I was awestruck almost immediately. The first day in the Everglades was really supposed to be more like a tour. One of my colleagues wanted to get video footage, so they held out their camcorder and started taking some clips of us riding across the swamp waters. I was looking out towards the waters. I knew that the soft-shelled turtles would most likely be seen poking their heads out from time to time rather than roaming the land. We started to get to the thick of it. We were surrounded by strange types of flora. The captain said that they knew plenty of them. He started chattering off names like bald cypress and sawgrass and we had even seen some orchids and bromeliads. It was quite a treat. Just as we are getting comfortable, I started to notice an unusual scent. It smelled awful, like sulfur and B.O. And first, I thought it might have been one of my crewmates, but after it lingered for a minute, one of my colleagues said, Whoa, what's that awful smell? I noticed the captain at this time started to look a bit worried, and they said, hey, it's getting pretty close to sundown, so we need to turn around, but it wasn't getting close to sundown. It was only 3 p.m., so one of our leads started to get a bit fussy. The captain responded, I'm happy to bring you all back tomorrow, but right now, we must leave. My colleague who was taking video clips started whacking me on the shoulder. I was very frustrated, so I turned around and snapped at them. That's when I realized they were pointing out towards the bald cypress, or that's what I think it was. Off in the distance was a strange, orange-brown creature. It was walking through the trees and swamp with no difficulty at all. And before we knew it, it was gone. I thought we had something. It might not have been a turtle, but it was something. But the captain assured us that it was not safe, that we needed to leave. So we left. On the way back, the captain told us about what we had seen. They knew it. And they were terrified of it. And that's when we heard the unsettling noise that howl and since then i've been terrified of the everglades we didn't even go back for our paper and as far as my colleague who was recording the things we saw they had been so scared that they dropped the camera into the swamp what had we seen the captain seemed to know but all i can say is that it was very large it walked upright and it smelt foul
So, I've been a nurse for a while, almost 10 years now. If I knew everything then that I know now about what it takes to be a nurse, I'm not sure I would have signed up to do it. But now, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I've got to travel all around, meet all kinds of amazing people, and every day is another interesting story to tell. It can be a little much at times though. There is this one nursing home I worked at a couple of years ago, and the experiences I had there are something I think about every day. Anyone who doesn't believe in the supernatural should work up at this place for a week and let me know if they're still skeptical. It was seriously messed up. It was a beautiful, old, historic facility in New England, and the residents were lovely people at first. They were so gracious, and they made me feel like I was really making a difference in their lives. It was like I was a part of their family, and I looked forward to coming to work and seeing everybody. But then, some seriously strange things started happening around the facility. At first, it was just small things. Every once in a while, I would hear laughing or crying in the hallway when nobody was there. There were some of the residents that would stare at things that weren't there or talk to someone who would regularly visit them even though there was nobody there. Naturally, the residents are all older and many of them have dementia, so I didn't think anything of it. But all of them would openly talk about the spirits that they interacted with that day and it became impossible to ignore. I would hear disembodied whispers in empty rooms and even in the parking lot when I was walking to my car. Doors would open and slam closed by themselves and it got to the point where we would regularly discuss our paranormal experiences at the staff meetings. I suggested that a priest should come and cleanse the place regularly, but due to protocol, we weren't allowed to impose religious beliefs on the residents. One night, while doing my rounds, I heard this bizarre chanting coming from one of the rooms. I peeked around the corner, and there was a group of five residents huddled together and chanting in a language that I couldn't understand. It seemed like it might have been Latin or something, but it freaked me out, and I just got away from them. As time went on, there were more and more incidents like this, and the residents would be more and more open about their occult practices. They would paint symbols on the walls, wear matching cloaks, hold secret meetings in their rooms at night, etc. It got to the point where we had to make rules and enforce them. No occult practices, no vandalism, lights out at 10 o'clock, etc. It started to take a serious mental toll on all of us, and it seemed like we were fighting a losing battle. More and more of the residents would exhibit suspicious behavior and sneak around to do God knows what in their rooms. One night, I was checking on this lady, and I saw a dark figure appear in the corner of her room. I started staring at it, thinking it was my mind playing tricks on me. But the outline started to look more and more human. I asked her if she saw anything in the corner, and she calmly stated that he visits her every night to let her know that her time is drawing close. Then she looked at me right in my eyes and said that he said I was next if I didn't get the hell out of there. I tried to act calm, but I was sick to my stomach and I got out as quickly as possible. The woman ended up dying shortly afterward. One night, I was doing my rounds when I heard a blood-curdling scream coming from one of the resident's rooms. I ran to see what was going on, and I found one of the residents lying on the floor, convulsing and foaming at the mouth. I rushed to help her. When the lights shut off and the door slammed, I was absolutely panicking, and I felt my way over to the bed 
and pushed the call button to get some assistance. I heard heavy footsteps from inside the room and an awful breathy groan coming from a corner of the room. Not from the poor woman writhing around on the floor. It didn't sound human and I was absolutely terrified. Finally, the door opened and a team of nurses turned on the light and rushed to help the poor woman. The woman ended up passing and I had to run outside to collect myself. It was the most freaked out I had ever been in my entire life. Some of my fellow staff mates and I began to suspect that some members of the staff were joining the residents and participating in the rituals with them. They would claim to be working and routinely disappear for a while and then show back up acting strangely. It got to the point where I couldn't work there anymore. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. I would see dark figures at my home and everywhere I went. It really began to affect my mental health and I was constantly living in fear. I finally got transferred and I always felt guilty that I abandoned those poor residents who considered me family. They deserved to live out their final years in peace, but instead they were living in what felt like a portal to hell. As guilty as I still feel today, I'm also relieved that I was able to get out of there. I haven't dealt with anything like that since I left. Now, when I talk about the unknown forces of life with others, it's typically in a positive light. My patients and I will talk about how when you die, you go to a better place and you get to see the people you loved during this lifetime. I don't know for sure what happens after we pass on, but I know I'm grateful. I don't have to live constantly in fear anymore. I hope that facility in New England has changed since I've been gone. But every time I think about it, it creeps me out. If I had stayed any longer, I wonder how differently my life would have turned out. There's a building in the heart of Old Town that has caught my attention, and I can't shake the feeling that something suspicious is happening inside. I'm not quite sure what to make of it, but I thought that you might be interested in hearing about it. I've been living about five minutes from the heart of Old Town for years now. It's a place that has seen better days, and most of the buildings there have been abandoned or are in a state of disrepair. There's one building that stands out from the rest. It's a large, imposing structure with sleek lines and modern architecture. It's completely out of place in a neighborhood like this. I'm a writer and I spend most of my days working from home, but I'm also a curious person and I can't help but wonder what goes on inside that building. I've watched it for weeks and I've noticed that there are constantly people in suits going in and out. It piqued my curiosity and I can't help but wonder, what are they up to? One day, I decided to get a closer look. I walked up to the building and as I got closer, I noticed there were no windows or signs. It was completely nondescript except for the people in suits going in and out. As I approached, I noticed a strange humming sound coming from inside. I walked around the building, trying to find a way in, but there was no visible entrance. The humming sound was getting louder, and I could feel it vibrating through my bones. It was a strange sensation, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. As I stood there, a man in a suit approached me. He asked me what I was doing there, and I explained that I was just curious about the building. He didn't seem convinced. He asked me to leave. As I turned to go, I noticed a group of people in suits coming out of the building. They all seemed nervous and tense, and they quickly got into a waiting car and drove off. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was going on, and I decided to do some digging. I started talking to people in the neighborhood, and I found out that no one knows what goes on inside that building. It's a mystery. 
and it's clear that the people in suits don't want anyone to know what they are up to. As I continued to watch the building, I noticed that the people in suits were becoming more aggressive. They started to follow me when I walked by, and they would glare at me from inside their cars. It was a strange feeling, and I couldn't help but wonder, what were they so afraid of? I was becoming increasingly anxious and paranoid. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, and I started to second guess my decision to investigate the building. I knew that I needed to be careful, but I couldn't help but feel like I was in over my head. One day, as I was walking by the building, one of the men in suits grabbed me and pulled me into the alley. He told me to stop asking questions and threatened me if I didn't stay away from the building. It freaked me out and I realized that I had underestimated the danger of my investigation. I knew that I needed to get to the bottom of what was going on inside the building, but I also knew that I couldn't do it alone. I decided to reach out to a friend who works for a local newspaper. She was intrigued by the story, and she agreed to help me investigate. We decided to dig deeper into the building's ownership and permits. We talked to city officials and did some research, and we found out that the building is owned by a corporation that has ties to some powerful politicians. It became clear that this was just not a simple case of curious activity. We did some research, but we couldn't find any concrete answers. It was like the building was a black hole, absorbing all the information around it. I never did find out what was going on inside that building, but I did learn that sometimes the truth is elusive and it's up to us to keep asking questions and investigating. The building is still there and the people in suits still come and go, but I'm not as curious or as brave as I used to be. I've learned to accept that some things are beyond my control. As I pass by the building now, I can't help but feel a sense of unease. I know that there's something going on inside that I'm not meant to know about, but I've made my peace with that. I've become more cautious and aware of my surroundings since my investigation. I've learned that there are some things in this world that are better left undiscovered. Looking back on the experience, I realize that sometimes the truth is too hard to find. I've learned to accept that I may never know what's going on inside the building. I've come to terms with it, and I value my life more than uncovering the truth of that building. The world is a strange and mysterious place, and I've had lots of people tell me it's better to just let things be sometimes, but I'm not so sure that's true. Taking on the truth of the people that run that place is bigger than just me, but I hope that someday that the truth is unearthed. To this day, it still drives me crazy, and there's still lots of activity at that place. This is crazy. I wanted to reach out and share my family story with you. We recently moved into a new home, and strange things have been happening ever since. We've been experiencing unexplainable events, and without a shadow of a doubt, the house is seriously haunted. After lots of research, we discovered that the previous owner of the house was a notorious serial killer who buried his victims in the backyard. To anyone buying a house, I don't care how cool it looks, or how much character you think it has. Do your research before buying. A quick search could have saved my family and me so much time, energy, and peace of mind. I think this experience has taken years off of all of our lives. My spouse, two young children, and I have been searching for a new home for months. We finally found the perfect place in a quiet suburban neighborhood. It was an old house but it had been recently renovated and we were excited to start a new chapter in our lives. I'm a stay-at-home parent and my spouse works at a design firm. We wanted a fresh start and we thought a new house and a new location were going to be perfect for our family. This could not have been further from the truth. Strange things started happening pretty much immediately after we moved in. 
The first strange occurrence happened just a few days after we moved in. I was unpacking boxes in the living room when I heard a faint whisper. It sounded like someone who was saying my name, but no one was there. I tried to brush it off, but the heavy feeling of being watched never left. As days went by, the strange occurrences became more frequent. Doors would open and close on their own, and we would hear footsteps in empty rooms, down the stairs, and down hallways. We started to feel like we were being watched all of the time. At first, my spouse tried to assure the family that there was no such thing as ghosts, but very quickly, we all began to have experiences that we couldn't explain. One night around 3 a.m., my spouse and I heard what sounded like a party downstairs. We heard music, laughter, glasses clinking, cheers, and people talking loudly. We decided to investigate the strange sounds we were hearing downstairs. Fully expecting to find a room full of strangers we would have to kick out, we searched the entire house, but found nothing unusual, and the sounds had stopped. After that, the experiences started to escalate, and we started seeing apparitions of white mist throughout the house. It would appear out of the corner of our eyes and then disappear. Then it started happening in front of us while we were alone and then it would appear when we were together as a family. We would all silently stare at it, totally freaked out, and then it would disappear. Then my youngest child started talking to an imaginary friend, whom she called the man in the basement. She claimed that the man in the basement would play with her, make jokes about my spouse and me, sing to her, and would always want to play in the backyard with her. This was before we discovered the article about the bodies being buried back there. That gives me the creeps just thinking about it. I tried to shrug it off as a child with an active imagination, but every time she'd talk about the man in the basement, it always had a deeply sinister feel to it. We started to research the history of the house and found out that the previous owner was a notorious serial killer who had buried his victims in the backyard. We realized that the strange occurrences might be related to the past of the house. One night, we heard a loud banging coming from the basement. We went down to investigate. We found the door to the crawl space had been ripped off of its hinges. The crawl space was empty, but we could feel a strong presence of someone or something in there. We started to feel like we were in danger. We decided to leave the house for a few days hoping that things would calm down. When we came back, we found all the furniture had been moved around, and the doors and the cabinets were open, and the house was freezing on the inside. This was when my son first discovered an article online of the house's gruesome history. We called the police, and they confirmed that the house we were living in was the home to several of the most horrific crimes in the town's history. We decided to reach out to a paranormal investigator to help us understand what was going on in the house. After a thorough investigation, they found extensive evidence of paranormal activity. EMF readings, creepy voice recordings, evidence of intelligent entities, you name it. They mentioned it was one of the most active houses they had ever been to. The paranormal investigator explained to us that the house was haunted by the killer and his victims who had unfinished business and needed closure. We were shocked to find out the truth about the house's history. We had no idea what we were getting into when we moved in. After learning the truth, we decided to move out of the house as quickly as possible. We didn't want to risk our family's safety and well-being. We found a new home and thankfully, we haven't experienced any paranormal activity since. The experience left us all scarred. We couldn't believe that we had been living in a house with such a dark history. We were glad to have found out the truth, and we were grateful for the support we received from the paranormal investigator and local authorities. We tried to move on from the experience, but it stayed with us for a long time. We couldn't help but think about the victims and their families, and we hoped that they had found peace. 
The experience taught us to be more careful when choosing a home. We realized that we should always do our research and look into the house's history before moving in. The experience also opened our eyes to the existence of the paranormal. We couldn't explain the strange occurrences in the home, and we realized that there was still so much that we didn't know about the world. We were left with more questions than answers, and we wondered if there were more haunted houses and unsolved mysteries waiting to be uncovered. This experience happened about five years ago. My grandmother was getting older, and her health was starting to deteriorate rapidly. She started losing mobility and had to walk around on a walker. Her memory began fading, so conversations with her became less stimulating and more depressing. She lost all of her teeth and refused to get dentures, so she had to eat soft foods. She would still put solid foods in her mouth for the taste, but she'd spit it out into a napkin afterward. It was hard to watch. She had to go on blood thinners, and the slightest thing would cause her to have some gruesome-looking bruises all over her body. One time, her entire arm was purple, and I asked what had happened, thinking she must have taken a bad fall. She looked at me and said, It was the wind. My grandmother used to be the most special person in my life, and I loved every second I got to be with her. We'd go on day trips, just the two of us, and I always felt so much love in her presence. My family thought it would be best to send her to a nice assisted living facility, and she fought that entire process tooth and nail. Once she got there, however, she seemed to be excelling, she was making friends, going on shopping trips, and going to concerts they would put on there. She regained her appetite and started taking her medication more regularly. When I would visit her, she would always have fun things planned and talk about the latest things she did. For a while, it seemed like she was about to live her best years at this place, and I was feeling good about everything. Then, one day, I went to visit her and she was carrying around this vintage doll close to her heart. She said it had belonged to a close friend who had recently died, and I didn't think too much about it at the time. The doll was creepy though. It had cracks on its face, black hair, and an angry expression. It was wearing this tattered Victorian era dress, and its eyes were faded and weirdly far apart. It honestly gave me the creeps, but it made her think of her friend, so I thought it was kind of sweet. The next time I visited her, she was watching a soap opera in her room, and she was still clutching the doll over her heart. I said hello to her, but she was in deep concentration watching the TV program. I clapped and even walked in front of the TV at one point, but she was in a trance. I shook her by the shoulders and finally got her attention. She was very agitated and said that she wanted to be alone to watch her stories. I told her I brought her favorite dessert in the world and she said she didn't want it. That was weird because she loved sugar and the box of cannoli I brought her was from her favorite place. I tried to put the box in her hands and take the doll from her and she threw the box against the wall and told me to get the hell out. She had never spoken or acted like this to me, and I was in shock. During the entire interaction, she never stopped clutching the doll close to her heart and glared at me angrily. I told her I'd visit later and got out of there. I talked to my family about it, and they said that it was just her getting older and told me to try not to take it personally. The next time I visited her, she didn't even look like herself. She sat in the chair, clutching the doll by her heart, and gave me the meanest glare. I was determined to have a good interaction with her, and I brought an old card that she had written me when I was just a kid. I told her how much it had meant to me all these years, 
and that I kept it with me. So if I was having a bad day, I could read it, and it always made me feel better. She didn't say a word. She was holding onto the doll by her heart so aggressively. I could see it shaking in her hand. I asked her how she was feeling, and she didn't say a word. She just kept glaring at me, shaking. I asked her if she knew how much she meant to me, and that she was my favorite person in the world. Still, nothing. I got pretty upset, and I ran out of the room. How could someone deteriorate that quickly? I asked the assisted living staff, and apparently, she was acting the same way with all of them. She wouldn't shower. She wouldn't talk. She stopped going to events, and she never left her room. One of the nurses said that she was glad at least she had the doll because she seemed to hate everyone else. They told me that dementia was common in the elderly and that it might be Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, or some other disease that deteriorated the brain. The next time I went to visit her, I brought tulips, which were her favorite flowers. She was fast asleep on the bed, lying on her back, and she was holding the doll on her chest. That doll was seriously giving me bad vibes, so I snuck over to the bed and grabbed it as sneakily as I could. I opened her closet and shoved it as far up there as I could, so she couldn't see or reach it. I gently woke her up, said hello, and showed her the tulips I got her. To my amazement, she was in a fantastic mood and was so grateful for the tulips. We had the best conversation, and we even cried talking about how much we loved each other. I left with the best feeling and just thanked God for that wonderful interaction. The next time I visited her, she was dead in her bed with the doll by her heart. The most horrific part is that the doll had a creepy smile on its face. I know that doll didn't have a smile before, and it absolutely terrified me. I was devastated that I found her dead, but I couldn't grieve because of that damn doll. I threw the doll in the trash and took it out to the dumpster a little while afterward. It left me with unanswered questions. Did that doll possess the body of my beloved grandmother? Did that doll kill my grandmother? How did the doll get out from the top of the closet? Why was the doll smiling? To this day, it freaks me out. I don't even want to think about that doll stealing my sweet grandmother's soul. But if that wasn't what was going on, what was? I need help identifying something. I wish I had a picture or a video. I know anything would be better than an erratic description of an animal that I only saw under the cover of night. I think it was an animal. I was working security for a cemetery at the time. The job is even more boring than it sounds. For the most part, I sat in a booth and read old paperbacks. I walk the grounds a few times a night. I kick out a couple of teenagers once a month, and I clean up after their pranks. That's the extent of the glamour. The headstones aren't as creepy after a few weeks. I was confident because of that boring routine that I could handle anything the job threw at me. I was wrong. On this particular night, late June, I saw something odd on one of the parking lot cameras. It was a flash, like someone was running toward the cemetery entrance. I figured it was some punk kid trying to force their way in, so I got up to greet them. I found no one at the gates. I searched with my flashlight, and I called out to announce myself, but there was no one to be found, and nothing to be heard. The dirt was kicked across the paved walkway like someone had run by, but there weren't any shoe prints that I could make out. I figured it was loose soil, thrown around by that afternoon's high wind. I made a note to sweep it up 
before the end of my shift. I returned to my booth, took a sip from my coffee, and then nearly jumped out of my skin. Something slammed into the large glass pane, separating me from the outside world. My shirt was suddenly covered in piping hot cappuccino, but I was confident the kids had snuck by me somehow. Now they were playing a game of harass the security guard. It wasn't entirely out of the ordinary. If it wasn't for the coffee on my shirt, I wouldn't have cared. At least, they would have been giving me something to do. When I leapt back outside, I realized what had struck my window. It was a mass of meat and fur the size of a small dog. There was no way to tell what it used to be. I pulled the pepper spray from my belt and looked around. Suddenly, I didn't feel like I was dealing with children. Something else had crossed my path. Peering into the dark, I tried to swallow my nerves and stand my ground. It was what I was paid to do, right? Maybe. My skin was crawling and my blood was ice cold. I'd never felt the hair stand up on the back of my neck, but I'm sure that it was that night. I felt like I was being watched. It wasn't just a part of a game. I was the game. Then it growled at me. It growled and I felt it in my bones. I felt it the way a mouse feels a cat purring over the fight to come. The mace in my hand felt like a toy. Was it really going to make a difference? I searched the perimeter for whatever was growling. Nothing. The rumble came in and out from one point and then the next. I didn't get my eyes on the monster until it wanted me to. It stepped purposefully into the beam of my flashlight. I noticed its paws first. I noticed how its fingers spread out long and lanky, almost like the digits of a human hand. I told myself that it couldn't have had a thumb. It wasn't human after all. It was too big to be human, too wild, too frightening. Its back was hunched and its posture was kept low to the ground. Its back and shoulders were covered in a thin, wiry hair. It reminded me of a sick dog, those ones you see peeking around the corner of an alleyway from time to time. When my eyes shifted from its body to its face, I froze. Its snout was elongated, just like I expected. Its snarl revealed a row of sharp yellow teeth, but there were emotions in its gaze. It wasn't looking at me with the indifference of some animal. It wasn't defending its territory or looking for food. I swear, in that moment, I felt hated and I thought I was dead. I resigned myself to whatever was coming. My mind and my heart gave up. This monster, creeping even closer out of the darkness, was going to be the end of me. My body had different plans, I guess. I pointed the pepper spray in my hands in the direction of the beast, and I fired a stream directly towards it. I was lucky that the animal was already standing downwind. I didn't stick around to see if the stream made contact, if the beast was blinded, or if it turned to run away. I ran away. I ran past the security booth, past the gate, and into my car. When I shut the door beside me, I risked another look outside. The creature, whatever it was, was gone. There was no sign of it. There was no chase. It didn't yap at my heels. It didn't leave a permanent scar for me to show off to my friends. Maybe that would have convinced them. When I got home, I made some calls. I told anyone I could. I asked if they had seen it lurking anywhere else around town. They called me crazy. They said the late hours had seeped into my blood, made me antsy. They told me I had imagined it. The morning shift caretaker had to clean up its mess, but he didn't see it. 
he didn't believe, either. I guess that's why I'm asking you. Have you heard of anything like this? The United States government is lying to you. I'm a high-ranking civilian member of the United States Air Force. I'm not enlisted with the military, yet my work with them provides me with extremely high levels of clearance and access. It's a complicated relationship, and I won't go into the full details of my work here. I can tell you that my main function is to surveil and analyze aerial phenomena in our Earth's atmosphere. If you follow Mr. Dredge's channel, you are likely one of the few enlightened who realize that the government is willing to go to significant lengths to cover up abnormalities and alter the narrative to suit their needs. Not just our government, all of them. Despite war and subterfuge between various nations, the one thing they can all agree on is the firm maintenance of the status quo. I am here to tell you the truth. Almost everyone in the nation has heard about the cylindrical objects shot down in the United States airspace. To date, the government has disclosed that four objects have been shot down, one Chinese surveillance balloon and three unidentified objects. The true number is 39, just this year alone. Over the past five years, a total of 62 similar objects have been eliminated from U.S. airspace. The rapid increase year over year has caused great concern within the military and government, and with good reason, which I will explain shortly. The reason that these aerial phenomena have just now come to light is very simple. The government is probing civilian reaction to these events in preparation for what is to come in the following years. While small fragments have demanded the truth, the vast majority are more than happy to accept half answers, such as benign research equipment. The exception to this was the Chinese surveillance balloon. In truth, this object was a prototype, reverse engineered from previously recovered remnants of this phenomenon. It was developed in collusion with the Chinese government, which is in reality one of our staunchest allies. The government claimed that the balloon was shot down on February 4th, over open waters of the Atlantic. This is a false claim. In truth, the device malfunctioned long before reaching the coast, crashing in East Palestine, Ohio, on February 3rd. The government responded quickly by derailing a train nearby and transporting vicious chemicals to the area before the media could react, all to recover the remains of their failed prototype. It may be a matter of coincidence that days after the Ohio disaster, three aerial phenomena entered the U.S. airspace, and it may not be. The aerial phenomena in question are indeed of extraterrestrial origin. As I have said, the U.S. government has removed 62 from airspace over the past five years. This is in conjunction with 223 others shot down worldwide over the same period of time. The government has successfully shot down and recovered seven of these devices. As of right now, the government does not have complete clarity on the purpose of these devices. Oddly enough, the government did in fact disclose accurate descriptions of these devices. Cylindrical and roughly the size of a car, however they did fail to mention that they are constructed of a type of metal that is completely foreign to anything found on Earth or identified within the solar system. It is an extremely thin and durable material, able to withstand the 1400 degree temperatures of the atmospheric entry. The body of the cylinders have microscopic fibers that appear to be composed of organic materials. At the tip of each cylinder are a series of markings, vaguely similar to ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. However, different enough that leading Egyptologists have been unable to decipher the markings. The material and markings are identical to a device recovered in 1987. The first one, STS-088-724-66, or what's known as the Black Knight Satellite, was recovered by a joint operation between the United States and the Soviet Union. 
STS-088, was identified as being in orbit for 250 years, roughly the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. This leads us to believe we were being monitored until reaching a certain achievement of the technological process. The devices have been identified as originating in the Wolf 359 star system. It is thanks to the efforts of the James Webb Telescope team that this was confirmed. And in fact, the Webb Telescope was designed to identify the emergences of the devices from deep space. We know very little about the civilization that is harbored in the Wolf system. We believe the first official contact came from them in 1977 during an event known as the WOW signal. However, the presence of hieroglyphs on the devices recovered caused the U.S. government to speculate that the civilization has visited Earth at points millennia ago. The reason that I'm revealing all of this now is due to what I believe is a significant likelihood of mass contact with said civilization. The fact that device entry has increased dramatically year over year is a cause for extreme concern. Recently, the devices have come equipped with payloads of toxic gases, as well as what we believe to be weapons with EMP capabilities. These have all fortunately been destroyed before payload delivery, and ongoing efforts are being made to destroy devices long before atmospheric entry. Now that you know the truth, we must look to the future. In the coming months, the nations of the world will play out a narrative of brewing conflict amongst one another. Russia will continue aggression toward members of NATO, and China will begin advances amongst its neighbors in the Pacific. Iran and North Korea will continue brandishing nuclear capabilities, and so on. This is being done to justify increased defense budgets, as well as start laying the groundwork for mass conscriptions across the globe. World War III is indeed on the horizon. However, it will be our world standing united against another. I will attempt to continue delivering the truth, though do not be surprised if my reporting ends abruptly. Stay safe and continue asking questions and demanding answers. I'm from New Jersey and have lived here my entire life, ever since I was a kid. I've always had full-blown fascination with the paranormal, supernatural, unknown. Call it what you will. I'd have always believed there's far more out there that science just can't explain. I've always loved hearing about aliens, Bigfoot, quantum physics, God, the universe, you name it. To me, Life's too short to talk about the normal, mundane, everyday things. I find most people are incredibly materialistic, and I would rather ponder the many mysteries of the universe than to hear about what Lamborghini you're going to trade your Ferrari in for. As much as I could flat my gums about what we don't understand, I've only had one true experience, where I came face to face with the force of the unexplained. Most people I tell this story to say I just saw some sort of woodland creature in the dark and my mind was playing tricks on me. Some people will flat out say that I'm lying or I'm crazy, but I know what I saw and luckily my best friend was with me and he saw it as well. One night my best friend and I decided to go camping in the secluded spot that we found deep in the woods. We were planning on going out there, getting away from everything, and just having a carefree boys trip. We planned on staying out there for a week, and thoroughly prepared and packed accordingly. We had everything we needed, food, beer, tents, lanterns, sleeping bags, entertainment, you name it. We were all set and ready to go. One night, we were sitting around the campfire swapping stories laughing and playing our guitars. We really had no idea what we were about to experience. Finally, nature called and I had to venture into the forest to take a leak. On my way back, what I first thought was just a shadow 
blocked my path. As I got closer, I started to make out the details of a truly terrifying creature. At first, I didn't want to believe what I was seeing. The thing was huge, with big bat-like wings, glowing red eyes, and hooves. It made these aggressive, threatening movements toward me, and at the time, I thought it had to be either a demon or Satan himself. I was absolutely terrified, and I couldn't move. I was in shock, looking at this hideous, demonic entity toying with me in the woods. Way back when I was a Boy Scout, I was told, if you ever saw a bear, you should try to make yourself as big as possible and make as much noise as you could muster. I knew I wasn't looking at a bear, but my instincts kicked in and I started flailing my arms and screaming at the top of my lungs. The demon didn't run away, and it looked like it was positioning itself to lunge at me. I really thought I was going to die. I kept making as much noise as possible, but the whole thing was so surreal. Suddenly, my friend ran over to me and stopped dead in his tracks when he saw the beast. The creature started backing up once he saw my friend and kept looking at both of us, huffing and hissing. Finally, we couldn't hear or see it anymore, and I told my buddy, let's get the hell out of here. We both sprinted toward the car as quickly as we could. We didn't bother grabbing our gear, putting out the fire, or anything. We just took off, climbed in the car, and drove down the road. We were both in shock and panic. What sort of demonic entity did we just encounter? Was it a demon coming to claim our souls? Satan himself amusing himself with our fear? Or some sort of freakish creature? Neither of us had the faintest idea and were desperate to come to terms with what we saw and what we had experienced. After driving for what felt like hours, we finally made it back to civilization. We were trying to justify what we had seen to each other, but the only plausible explanation we had come up with was that we had encountered a demon deep in those woods and we were lucky to be alive. We never returned to the campsite to pick up our gear. Both of us were far too afraid and traumatized to go anywhere near that place. Some time had went by, and my friend called me up and told me that he had been researching online for people who have had similar experiences and discovered a creature known as the Jersey Devil. The Jersey Devil has apparently been sighted thousands of times around the area where we had our terrifying encounter. There are all kinds of first-hand accounts of people witnessing the beast and it matches the description of what we saw perfectly. Is this some sort of otherwise unknown species that only exists in the area? Is this the same legendary creature that all of us are seeing? As terrifying as the encounter was, and as strange as it was to hear about the Jersey Devil, it was incredibly relieving to know that it wasn't a demon or Satan coming from my soul. All those years of church as a kid had me recounting my past of possible sins I had committed that would warrant a visit from such a demonic entity. I'm certainly not perfect, but I couldn't think of anything I had done that deserves that kind of retribution. It was bizarre reading the accounts of other people who had encountered the creature. They all talked about his glowing red eyes, which I can still vividly see in my mind to this day. Apparently, I'm not the only one who believed it was a demon, and many still think it is a cursed soul whose punishment is to wander the earth for the rest of eternity. After researching it with my friend, I doubt it's an actual demon. There is so much about this earth that we don't understand, and so much of the earth that we haven't discovered yet. It makes more sense to me that it's just a species of creature that we haven't officially discovered, at least that's what I tell myself, so I can sleep at night.
My dad and my uncle go searching for gold for a few weeks every summer at a cabin they share in the north of Canada. They never found anything. Sometimes they would come back with shed antlers, but that was about as interesting as it got. I think they both knew there wasn't any gold left in that river, but they used to go out there with my grandpa every year, and since he's passed on, I think they do it now to remember him. I finally convinced them to take me one summer. I was 13 and seemingly old enough to not be annoying. We were supposed to be gone for three weeks. The cabin was incredibly remote. We couldn't drive to it. We had to charter a float plane. That was the scariest part for me. The pilot drops you off and says he'll pick you up at such and such date. And that's that. He just leaves you there. This was the mid-80s, so we didn't have cell phones or GPS locator beacons. I think if you got appendicitis or something out here, you'd just die. I don't know if my dad or my uncle ever thought of that or not. We packed in enough food to last us the three weeks and started our hike in to the cabin. The float plane disappeared into the distance, and I realized just how alone we were out here. The cabin was maybe five or six miles from where we were dropped off, but since we had to carry everything in, it felt much longer. The cabin sounded much more exciting when my dad and uncle would talk about it. When I got there, I realized it was basically one room with a dirt floor. There was an outhouse about 30 yards away from the cabin and a food cache about 30 yards in the other direction. The cache was raised up off the ground to deter bears and other scavengers that might want to break into the cabin if we left food in there. So that meant every time you wanted something to eat, you had to climb the ladder and get your food from the cache. I was beginning to realize that I was woefully unprepared for this. I also realized that there was more hiking and fishing than there was panning for gold. Everything went fine for the first two weeks. Of course, we didn't manage to find any gold at all. In fact, of the three of us, I was probably the one who spent the most time trying to find it. My dad and his brother mostly fished. It was on the third and final week that we had our encounter. Looking back, there were definitely signs of them from the first day we arrived, but none of us paid too much attention. Rustling outside the cabin at night, that definitely wasn't the wind human footprints and shoes without tread by the edge of the river. My dad noticed them when we got off the plane. His explanation was that there must have been some hikers come through a few days before, but the pilot hadn't heard anything about a hiking party, and he was one of the few pilots that took people to this area. And like I said, the only way to get here is by float plane. We had four days before the pilot was scheduled to pick us up, we were all sitting outside the cabin, eating trout we had caught that day, when we noticed smoke coming from the other side of the river. It hadn't been a particularly dry summer, but my dad's first thought was a wildfire. Hopefully, it wouldn't cross the river, because if it did, we were totally screwed. We sat and watched the fire for a while, when we realized it wasn't a wildfire at all. It was a campfire directly across from ours. My uncle pulled out his binoculars and tried to get a look at the campers, but he couldn't see their faces, but he could make out their silhouettes. He said that there was at least a dozen of them, but they stayed close enough to the trees to hide in the shadows. We barricaded the door that night and it was a good thing we did. It was close to midnight when they approached the cabin. We could hear them moving around outside. They were speaking to each other in a language I didn't understand. I sat in the center of the room with my dad and my uncle. I watched the door handle move, but the barricade stopped it from opening. My uncle yelled at them through the window, but they just got louder. They were screaming and yelling now. I don't know what they were saying, but I knew it wasn't good. My uncle cracked open the window and shot a signal flare toward the voices. And then we felt something hit the door, hard, and then it hit the walls of the cabin. My dad grabbed the shotgun that we kept for bear defense. He yelled out 
that he had a gun and would use it if they didn't leave. The cabin was hit another time, and my dad pointed the shotgun straight at the door and fired. I didn't know if he hit anything, but the voices became quiet. None of us dared not go outside, so we just sat together in the center of the cabin until the morning. My dad faced the door with the shotgun. We waited for the sun before any of us stepped outside. Of course, they told me to stay in the cabin, but I didn't listen. I thought there would be a dead body out there, but there was nothing. No sign of them at all. But I did find out what was hitting the cabin so hard. There were arrows lodged in the door and the walls. They were primitively made. Stone arrowheads. Wooden shafts. The feathers looked to be turkey. They were attached to the arrow shaft. And what looked like to be some type of plant or grass wrapped around them. None of us knew what to think. They didn't come back the next night. In fact, we watched their camp move away from us by the smoke from their fire. They looked to be moving into the mountains. There were no trails in those mountains. They were too remote for hikers. I never found out who those people were or if they were even people. I never saw them, so I can't say for sure, but it was the last time I went to that cabin. I only ever saw it when I was drinking. That's why no one believes me. I'm six months sober now. I can still promise you, without a doubt in my body, that that thing I saw was real. I didn't imagine it. Despite the insistence of the police, the doctors, and my partners in sobriety, I know the truth. I just needed someone to listen to it. Can you do that for me? Can you listen? Three years ago, I was at my bottom. I stayed on that bottom for a long time. I'm still climbing out of it, I think. I lost my job. My personal life crumbled. My pride and my confidence were blown away by the wind. I found comfort where I shouldn't have. The alcohol didn't numb the pain. It didn't make me forget. It just gave me something else to swallow. It was easier to focus on digesting the wet heat in my stomach than it would have been to digest the fragile life I found myself in. Then it came knocking. Its long, bony fingers came rapping at my window. Fate at first, like the brush of a few tree branches against a glass pane. It lured me closer. I looked out, and I saw nothing. It wasn't ready to show itself yet, I suppose. But I felt it. I felt its presence the same way you feel comfortable sitting in a quiet room with your best friend. It felt familiar, and I wanted to feel it again. The next time it knocked, only a few days later, it was louder. This time, I flung the window open and leaned my head into the darkness. I watched its moon-colored skin disappear into the night. Hello, I called. I didn't know what I was speaking to. I didn't know what it looked like or what it wanted. For the time being, it was simply my pale friend. It was the only friend I had that night, and when it came back, again, only a few days later, I was eager to build upon that friendship. This time, it slammed into my window. I jumped at first. I stared nervously, sweating in my shorts and tank top. That was the first time I wondered how it viewed me, if it looked at me with the bottle in my hand, like a friend, or like an enemy. The anxiety passed, and I approached the window. The comfort was back, you see, and this time when I opened it, I watched its sparkling eyes blink just out of sight. It was my friend, I told myself. I kept drinking, and I kept waiting. The world was falling apart around me. What else did I have to do? Who else did I have to wait for? I left the window open. Eventually, it came back. It didn't need to knock. It let itself right in. I watched it from the nearest room as its long, claw-like fingers coiled around the windowsill. I watched those fingers carve into the wood like it was hot butter. The bottle in my hand 
couldn't have been full enough to make me brave in that moment. I trembled, but I couldn't look away. This was the friend I had been waiting for. It was a monster. It just pulled itself into my home. Its bald head passed the threshold next. Its ears were small and almost nodded to its head. It looked scared somehow. It looked the way that I felt. Its body was thin and gangly, emaciated, starving. I could count its ribs with ease. There were too many. When the creature's legs slinked through the window and it finally stood up to look at me, I cried. I screamed, I think. I didn't run or fight. I wept, and my friend did not approve of that greeting. It recoiled in horror, as if offended by my outburst. It slammed its arms and elbows into my wall. I watched picture frames hit the floor, and I heard the glass shatter. It rakes its nail-like fingers across the carpet, tearing up staples and foam padding. It crushed the table and turned my couch into confetti. But it never came for me. It never turned the violence toward me, although I feared constantly that it would. Instead, it destroyed everything around me. It opened its mouth, and when it tried to scream back, it yelled in my own voice. It was mimicking me. It was taunting me for the disaster that I'd become. It was showing me true destruction. It humbled me for thinking my grief was at all significant when terrible things like this lurked in the world. It faded away after that. It skirted back out the window, disappearing once more into the dark. All my friend left me was a mess. I cleaned what I could, bumped and scraped myself in my stupor. When the police arrived, well, you know what they thought. A drunken hallucination or a fantastic story to absolve myself of any responsibility. Neither of those things were true. I didn't carve the imprint of the creature's hands into my wall. I didn't destroy my house. Not when it was the only thing I had left. I welcomed their help though. I needed it. I needed the doctors and I needed the group that would convince me to sober up. They don't know that I stopped drinking just to keep it away. I don't want to hear that knocking ever again. I don't want the beast to know that I'm vulnerable and come once more to take advantage. I need friends, not monsters. I just wish that my friends would believe me. This wasn't a metaphor. This wasn't a nightmare. This was a creature at home in the darkness who tried to find a new home.